purple as my backdrop. Maybe not a good choice. <laughs> It's still warming up. It's still warming up. Anyone need hope this morning? What about hope? I love the subject of hope. I am an optimist by nature. I always think things are going to work out in the end. But I also know, as I share every church I speak to, that I believe that the church is headed for the best days ever. The greatest revival the world has ever seen. The church will come together. We'll have a hunger for holiness, we'll have a burden for the poor, we're going to have a heart that, that it just it's overwhelms and, and it's, it, it's just a, a filled to the fullest with God's love and his mercy. And I think between now and then, we're going to see the biggest battles the church has ever seen. The battles of racism, the battles over politics, the battles over things within our country. So, so what gives us hope? And, and when I was asked uh, to speak on the subject, uh, I, I looked on my shelf in my library, and there's an old book, I don't even know the author, but uh, uh, the phrase, Prisoners of Hope, Prisoners of Hope, it's in the Bible. And, and I found this little book, a commentary on the book of Zechariah. How many have a commentary on the book of Zechariah, <laughs> besides Pastor Eric, good stuff. And the title was, Zechariah, the Prophet of Hope. So I started reading this, uh, and, and it just kind of snowballed. And I think even as a kid, you know, we are influenced. Uh, uh, one of the areas that we can update, just a quick update, uh, the movie Unplanned came out this past week. Are, and how many are not familiar with Unplanned? Uh, some of you have not heard of it. Uh, it's a movie about Abby Johnson, who was the former state director of Planned Parenthood, of the biggest state, the biggest area, as a young woman, who eventually got to witness what goes on during an abortion procedure and changed her view and has become one of the leading spokesmen. We, are in the same agency, we have worked together. She, she often has secret retreats for women who are dealing with healing and sexual abuse, and she's invited Dawn and I to go up and be a part of those and to help minister to some of the women. One was right here in Philadelphia not too long ago. Uh, well, it was, they filmed the movie in secret because of all the politics and all the persecution and all that was going on. They, they found a secret location, filmed this movie. It was released this past week to record crowds across America. Many theaters are signing it up again because there's so much of a demand for it, and yet still the word is just beginning to get out. And I find that interesting because of the prophecies uh, of the conference I went to in, in Toronto that to reach the millennials, we need to capture the entertainment. It's one of the seven spheres of influence with government and education and finance and all the things that influence the world. Entertainment is one of the biggest, particularly for the younger generation. What a story can be told in a movie can influence so much more than maybe a sermon or a crusade of milligrams. So I think back to when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, one of my heroes. We, we most times our hope is placed in an object and, or a person, and for me it was Batman. Now I know from hair, hair, hair like Superman, according to the the uh, art show upstairs. But but Batman was revolutionary in. TV history because it was the first show to have two prime time slots the same week. It was on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and every Wednesday night show had a different villain, always had a different power, and every Wednesday night show ended up with Batman in a jam, or he and Robin tied over a vat of acid, or heading towards the buzzsaw, and all of a sudden they were just about to die, and it would say, stay tuned, tune in tomorrow. Uh, same bat time, same, same bat, bat channel. They're right at the brink of hopelessness. Will we ever get out? I still hate that today. My wife and I hate that when we watch a show and we're thinking it should be over in five minutes, but we're never going to wrap this up in five minutes. And all of a sudden it says, to be continued. How will they get out of this jam? How is this going to end? And that is part of the frustration of a world that doesn't know God is they don't know how it's going to end. They don't have hope. I think of Superman, and uh, I, I look at all kinds of things, all the different Superman movies of, of you know, he, he has all these powers and he's going to save the world of that generation of the 40s and 50s, but what happens if there's something stronger than Superman? What happens if he's around kryptonite? 
they portray it in so many different things, but he gets weak in the one movie. He gets jabbed in the side with a shard of kryptonite and falls into the water, and he's drifting down, and he's weaker, and he falls to the bottom, and he can hardly even move. This guy who could lift up buses and fly, like, he can't even pull it. Oh, hope is lost. Movies are great. So I don't know when you think of movies that display hopelessness to hope. Anything come to mind? Favorite movie? It's the theme of many, many movies, bringing people to the edge. You have one here. Shawshank Redemption. So I do. It's one of the top ten listed. It's one of the most hopeful movies. Anyone else? Lord of the Rings. I didn't even think of Lord of the Rings, but that certainly has the up and down, doesn't it? A back and forth. That will we ever make it? I don't. I haven't seen that one yet. That's based on the song, right? That happened. Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful life. Oh my goodness! It's not such a wonderful. Uh, everything he worked for is gone, and I, I have, he, He's hopeless. And, uh, I should have never been born. Uh, how about uh, Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith? That's a good one. Guys on the streets changing their locker. He's trying to overcome stuff. Aaron Brockovich. Tiny little woman going against corporations and worldwide finance. It's it's that little David and Goliath. It's the underdog against the world. And so much in the world today, the church feels that way. We feel hopeless, overwhelmed, outnumbered, outfinanced. Certainly in the pro-life world, <laughs> you know, when you think about all the stuff that's going on, and yet the momentum is shifting in that battle. The momentum is shifting, but. Even more individually, I mean, we, we feel that way a lot. When do you feel most hopeless? You know, do you ever feel overwhelmed or just inadequate or, or uh, frustrated and helpless? I, I went to visit my 95-year-old aunt last week who had a little, little stomach surgery. <laughs> Something got twisted inside and they cut her from year to year. And she is still sharp and recovered. And, and visiting her was one of my cousin's wives. And... Uh, we don't know each other well, so we happen to walk in at the same time. Hey, how you doing? We're going to visit. So it's like, she said, I just got off of work. Well, it was 8.30 in the morning. My brother and I went to see my aunt, and uh, she said, I, I work at, at the pediatric hospital. I'm a pediatric nurse. And, and I said, really? What, what kind of things are going on? She said, well, I, I work in the psych ward. Pediatric nursing for psychology. And I said, well, is, is it busy? She said, we're swamped. We've never been so overwhelmed with kids. I said, well, what's the problem? And she said, hopelessness. Hopelessness. Suicide. Teenage suicide. Pediatric suicide of kids who, before they're even 12, 13, 14, have given up hope that life will ever be normal, that life will ever be good, that this world is worth living. And, uh, oh, my goodness, she started sharing the stories of 8, 9, 10-year-olds and what they're doing and what they're going through. I, I looked it up, I googled hopelessness in Christianity, not Christianity today, psychology today. The headline was, we are facing an epidemic of hopelessness, 2018. We are facing an epidemic of hopelessness. So it, it's a big problem. What do we need? What do we expect? I, I share this often when I speak here and everywhere. Of all the years of my 13 years of Bible school and seminary, one class stands out to me more than everything else, a counseling class I had to take. And out of all the counseling classes, we had a guest speaker come in from Westminster Seminary, uh, part of the uh, uh, Jay Adams, it's Jay Adams uh, School, and, and he gave a whole counseling course in one hour. Everything that I learned in 13 years, everything I learned in a year of counseling could be boiled down to this one hour. The most practical things I ever learned is that we all have expectations, whether it's in a dating, whether it's from a job, whether it's when I come to church, whether it's in life, whether it's from God, we have expectations. And if we're dealing with one of these feelings, anxiety, fear, most common in women, anger, most common in men, but not exclusive, right? Men get anxious and get ulcers, and then depression. And the whole course came down to this. If you're not sure you're going to get what you want, whether it's a good health report, you're going to get the job, you're going to get married, you're going to have a child, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to what I want, what I hope, what I expect will happen in my life. If I'm not sure it will ever happen, I get anxious. It, 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 and yet the Bible says over and over and over again, most commonly, be anxious for nothing, nothing. nothing. But then if, 
if something blocks what I want, my immediate and dominant emotion is anger. The simplest uh, illustration I use all the time is just driving to church. I should be in a good mood. I'm praising God. I'm going to worship with my friends. I'm going to learn with God. And somebody pulls in front of me and goes slow. They're blocking what I want. I honk, even if they don't love Jesus. <laughs> right? Right? They're, they're my response. If I want to get the promotion someone else gets, I get angry. If someone else takes my parking spot, I get angry. And, and you can go through all the list of a thousand expectations, particularly in America. we got a lot of expectations of what I deserve and what is my right. And, and I, I need that. And if I don't get what I want, I get angry. <coughs> no politics because how angry our country is of, of who's elected and who's not elected. But there's anger. And the root of it is in not getting what we want. And here's the tragedy. If we dwell on that long enough, and if we ever get to the point where we think we'll never get what we want, I'll never have a child. I'll never get healthy again. I'll never get that job. I'll never, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never, I'll never. Experts tell me, and according to my course, if you think that way for more than three to six months, your brain begins to change. Our brain expert could maybe tell us more what chemicals change, the pathways change, and it begins to develop what can develop into clinical depression. Because the chemicals in your brain are now all the one alive. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Whatever is good and pure and of good report, we dwell on those things, our brain changes. And if we don't, the simple verse in Genesis, I'm studying Genesis in my devotions, if you do, know, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do well, to, to Adam, or was it Cain and Abel in the midst of that? It's like, if you do well, if you do the right stuff, things will change. Don't wait for things to change and then you feel better. You do the right things, the Bible basics we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. So that, that course in itself has helped me sort through when I talk to people and couples and in my own life. It's different. So how do we define hope? There's so many definitions, but I love this. It's a firm and certain expectation for good. And, and, and it leads to a joyful and contented heart expressed in safety, in security, in prosperity. Things are going to work out. Eventually. Maybe not till the Lord comes back for some things. But what are you hoping for? And hope is not just, I wish. I wish the Eagles would win another Super Bowl. I wish I could do this. I, I, I hope this works out. It would be nice if this happened. We, we say, I hope, I hope. And I, that's a, the wrong word. It's a whole different Greek and Hebrew thing. I don't want to get too technical on that. But that, that wishing hope is not at all the biblical hope, which is a rock-solid, certain truth that cannot be taken away. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Well, what is that? What is it? God said, you can expect this to be sure. These are things you can know for sure that God will do for you, and you will never have to be anxious. You will never have to be angry, and you never have to be depressed because these are certain truths that God said he will do for you and all his people. We need to focus on those, and we're going to look at that just real quickly. Uh, again, knowing the situations here, and it seems like Murphy's rule of uh, preaching again this morning, three or four of the folks that are in our church and it could really use a message on hope <laughs> are not here. It's like, oh, it's, it's a constant battle. But we need hope. We need hope. Maybe you're in a situation you don't see any change. You don't see any progress. I've been trying to do this and my husband's not getting any better. I've been trying to do this and my wife isn't responding. I've been trying to do this and my kids haven't come back to the Lord. I've been doing, and I, I talked to a guy this week from another church. He said, I've been doing all the stuff you said and nothing's changed. Hold on, How, you got to keep doing the right things. That's, that's not like, well, we want everything today. And the illustrations we're going to have, how, how, how can I help you have stronger hope, increased hope? I have four, and, and to quote the old King James, yay, there are five, because <laughs> I added another one this morning. There are four. The first glimmers of hope, the first glimmers of hope. One of the first things, no matter what you're facing, that you might feel hopeless about is that others have been right where you are and have made it back. Others have been set free. Others have been restored. It's one of the great things of AA and the counseling meetings. You know what? I'm not alone. I'm not alone. I've been there. I'm 
what was it, 29 years for Leo, right? 29 yeah. years in the program. That's fantastic. Next year, 30 years in the program. And, and, and it's not always easy up and down and back and forth. I know in the pregnancy center world, what I speak almost uh, is not, not as much as I would want, but about 30 times a year. I was at one in Ohio one Thursday night at a pregnancy center. And one of the things when a woman comes in with an unplanned or unwanted pregnancy, and she's not sure what to do is to sit down with someone and say, I was your age and I was pregnant and I didn't think I could make it, but here I am and here's my daughter. Here I am and here's my family. And you can make it. We are going to give you hope. We're going to help you through this. We're going to support you. We're going to give you tools. You can do this. And they come in thinking there's no way. There's no way. We, we need to offer hope. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we're facing, there are stories in the Bible and there are stories in the church. That's why we need to have testimonies and, and to share what is God doing. If I'm putting a lane on call, she has a palm on hope. Before the offering, I'm going to make sure you do that because it's really good. Part of our art show. What does the Bible say? Just think about hopeless situations in the Bible. Israel's in captivity. They're killing all the male babies. You're now pregnant. What are you going to do? Think about taking a baby and putting it in a little basket, a little ark in a river filled with alligators and rapids and enemy soldiers to think about that desperation that was faced. And we see God's hand on that. We have Elisha. It's one of my favorite verses and stories in all of Scripture because it's funny. To me, it's funny. There's humor. Elisha and his servant are in a cabin. The servant goes out to get water, and when he goes out, the whole mountain is surrounded with an army by the enemy. And he comes in and says to Elisha, we're surrounded. And Elisha says, there are more with us than against us. That's just funny. Can you imagine the servant? It's me and you, and you and me, and it's me and you. And he looks out the window, and there was how many? I look out the back window, and I look out this window. We're surrounded. What are you drunk? What are you high? What are you smoking? There's more with us than against us. What are you thinking? And he prays, Lord, open his eyes. Open his eyes that he might see the mighty host that is about us. I love that story. How about Gideon? Gideon, 30,000 men, 33,000 men facing an army of 120,000 plus, according to Judges 8.10. And God says, all right, you're going to fight. Well, look, well, we're, well, we're outnumbered four to one, five to one. And God says, you know what? There's too many. <laughs> There's too many. And, and it says in the text, because if you win, you're going to think you did it because you're such a good fighter or you're so smart. So let's just have a draft. If you're afraid and like to go home, just leave. And 22,000 left. And there's still too many. And he whittles them down to what seems to be a hopeless situation of just a small little army against this vast multitude so they could see that the victory belongs to the Lord. For any of us who feel overwhelmed, outnumbered, outmanned in the battle. God is with us and nothing can be against us. Je Jehoshaphat had the same thing, surrounded with 130,000, 180,000 men. And he prays to the Lord, we are helpless before our enemy, but our eyes are on you. Because if God be for me, who can be against me? No one and nothing. The answer is implied, right? How about, uh, I can't read that, but my new glasses, I can't read that one. Okay, David's depression. We think of David and Goliath, good guy, a little stick, takes on the thing. But how many times in the Psalms did he said, Lord, my enemies are, have surrounded me. My adversaries can stare me. I can't even turn. My bed is filled with tears. My body aches. I can't even sleep. He was such a roller coaster. Because at times he forgot. He forgot how good God is. Financially, the widow is down to her, her last little bit of oil, and Elijah comes, and there's just enough flour, there's just enough oil for just, we're going to have the last supper, our last meal, and then we're going to die. And it never runs out. And they're crying out for that. There's so many examples. So one of the ways we have hope is to look back and, and be around people who have been through what we share, but so often we don't share with people. Hey, I'm struggling right now. I'm alone right now. I'm, I, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to get this job. I don't know how it's going to turn out. Oh, oh I remember when I was there. <laughs> or let me, let me introduce you to this guy or girl because they've been through something like that. Those past examples can bring us hope. We can also have hope because of the promise. There's hundreds and hundreds of promises. Praying the promises of God was life-changing for me. We're just going to look at one. Because it's on every graduation card, every June, it comes out over and over and over again. The promise from Jeremiah 29, 11, which says, 
for I know the plans that I have for you. Right? Here it is. Here, let's go back here. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. It's a great verse in a bad chapter, according to Tony Evans. I listened to his sermon on this. I love Tony Evans and his good teaching. A good verse in a bad chapter. So we have hope. So what is the setting? What is the setting? If you have your Bible, I'm going to just give you a quick example. I still old school. I want to open my Bible. I love the PowerPoint. Jeremiah 29. If you have a Bible, turn there because these should be underlined. Just the setting is always important. Let me read you the setting. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests and to the prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into <coughs> exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. And it sorts through the rest of them there that they had gone into exile. This is a letter. This promise is part of a letter sent to a people who had seen their temple destroyed, their families torn apart, their loved ones killed, their army decimated, and now they're carried in and gone three, four hundred miles away through the desert in captivity, bound in chains. That's why we picked that song, My Chains Are Gone. And prisoners, prisoners are in chains. My chains are gone. But to this group of people, Jeremiah sends a letter. And he says in that letter, I know the plans I have for you to give you a future and a hope, not to bring you harm. Well, I'm experiencing harm. Why am I experiencing harm? We'll go back to Jeremiah 25 and it tells you why. Because you ignored the prophets, because you continued in sin, because you would not turn back to the Lord, you're now going to be punished for your 70 years of disobedience. You're going to be in captivity for seven years. We talk a lot about parenting here. Not a whole lot of younger kids' parents here, but the, you know, clear, consistent consequences. You're grounded for a year. Well, maybe overreaction. Real, realistic, right? But how many times do we say, I'm sorry, you're no TV for you for a week? Come on, my favorite show's on tomorrow. All right, just, just one, just one show. And immediately we go from a week to one show to, oh, go ahead, play. You can watch it on your No! There's got to be a consequence, and it's got to hurt. Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10 talks about God will punish you when you turn from God so that, so that, so that, the purpose clause, you will turn back to God. So he puts them in captivity in Jeremiah 25. And uh, Romans 5 also talks about tribulation. Well, it's opposite of what I'm hoping for, but the tribulation produces character, and character produces hope and a hope that does not disappoint. So our pain has a prophecy. God has a plan. And sometimes it seems exactly opposite of what we want, but God has a plan. So we need to stick with those promises, even in the midst of it. The third way that we can increase our hope is because of the prophecies. And this leads us to my guest speaker today, my prophet, my little book, Zechariah, the prophet of hope. The verse is in chapter 9, verse 12. It says, return to your fortress to these same exiles that Jeremiah was talking to. To these same people, Zechariah says, Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. For even now I announce that I will restore to you twice as much <coughs> as you. There's a promise in the midst of a difficult time. Now what's transpired from Jeremiah 29 to Zechariah chapter 9 is 70 years. The 70 years have been complete. The, the declaration of Cyrus it makes a decree, and, and some Jews are allowed to go back later, two years later, Darius, after the Medes take over, some great history, I don't want to confuse you, but it's all the dates are cleared, it's set up in there, and the 70 years were complete, and 50,000 of the millions of Jews taken captive, 50,000 of the millions of Jews go back. And the rest stayed. There's a whole sermon right there. How many would rather stay in their slavery? They've settled. They're, they're not happy where they are, but they won't take the steps to go back. God opened a door. We listened to all at breakfast this morning. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. The Babylonian Empire is going to set us free? We're, we're there, why would they do that? But Darius and Cyrus, both two different leaders, two different kingdoms, said, you know what? We're going to let you go back and rebuild your temple. I'm a slave. I would jump at that, but no, these people stayed. And the 50,000 that went started to build the temple, but they go, and my goodness, there's a lot of work. Oh, it's 
burnt down and it smells like smoke and the beams are falling. And, oh my goodness, this is hard and they work hard for two years. But where's the rest of the people? They're not here. Oh, I don't feel like working today. And now you've got to work twice as hard. And you don't feel like working, so she's got to work twice as hard. And in two years, they stop rebuilding the temple. And for 16 years after they were decreed to be free and victorious and blessed, they lived as slaves in their own land. Is that a picture of so many in the church today? We have all the promises of God, the provision of God. We've been set free and we live like slaves to our fears, to our worries, to our addictions because we don't experience and believe the promises of God. Zechariah, his interesting book, it said it's the most messianic prophet in the Bible. He's the most apocalyptic prophet in the Bible and the most eschatological guy in all the Bible. Nine, uh, 14 verses, and there's some neat verses that we get out of Zechariah, like the apple of my eye. There's a lot of things that we have the verse, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. There's some neat things, but that phrase, prisoners of hope, is the idea. Prisoners can't do anything but what they're enslaved to, and 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 Zechariah is saying to the people, you're no longer prisoners of Babylon, you're prisoners of hope. God has a plan and he's doing it and you're already set free and you're going to help him prepare and there's going to be a time where it's going to be twice as good as it ever was. But right now, you've got to clear the rubble. Right now, you've got to gather some new materials. Right now, you guys got to work together to build this and I will gather all the nations. There's a prophecy involved. Can we believe the prophecies of God? His name, it means one that remembers the setting. I already did that. What did they do? Uh, oh, that goes back. That's, a, that's, that's out of order. That's out of order. Okay. We'll skip that. But Palm Sunday, uh, it, the verse right before Zechariah 9.10 is, is 9.9. And it's about the Lord coming on the fall of the horse. It's the verse that they read and proclaimed to Jesus at Palm Sunday, which we celebrate next week. There's a prophecy of the very day of how the Lord would come to Jerusalem. And it was fulfilled the right animal, the right day, in the right city. And, and, and a few verses before that is a very clear prediction of the, 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 the nation of Tyre being completely destroyed. This rock nation in a fortress that had stood up to the Medes and the Persians and the Romans and the Babylon, and they felt that they were indestructible. And God said, I'm going to tear you down. And he describes exactly how he's going to do it. So much so that critics today say Zechariah could not have been written by Zechariah. He, he couldn't have known. He could not have known that Tyre could be destroyed that way. So he, somebody else must have wrote that after Tyre and put it in there to make it look like prophecy. And that, that's what the higher critics do of the Bible. But it's there. It's there. And, and it was fulfilled, the very letters of the law. And, and a little bit later, we have Zechariah 14. On that day, on that day, the Lord will descend and his foot will come on the mount and the mount will separate East and west, north and south. I forget the directions. Yeah, you go. Let, let us look at it. Let's look at it. Make sure I'm, I'm not misquoting. Zechariah chapter 14. Because I remember when I was in Israel, I don't know if uh, Vic and Becky had this or not. I'm going to ask them in a second. But it, it says in verse 4 On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west forming a great valley with half the mountain moving to the north and half moving to the south. And you will flee by my mountain valley and it will extend to Azel. And you will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah the king of Judah. Now, when you guys were in Israel, did they comment on this? Do you guys remember anything special about a hotel? Does that ring a bell? Give me a break. Because when I was in Israel back in 1991, we were standing on the Mount of Olives. There is the Mount of Olives. Taken from the temple. All those little white dots, all this stuff here, what are they? They're tombs. They're tombs. Why are there tombs right next to the temple? Because the Jewish people believe when the Messiah comes, they want to be the closest, the first to be resurrected. They believe in a resurrection. And when Jesus preached to the Pharisees and said, you're like a bunch of whitewashed tombs, you look good on the outside, but you're full of dead man's bones, he was standing at the cemetery. And he was saying, you guys look good with your robes and your phylacteries and all your beads and all your stuff. But inside, you're wicked and corrupt. You're just like these tombs that are there. And people pay extra money to be buried closer to the temple. And it's on that mountain. 
Jesus is looking at the Temple Mount from the Mount of Olives. On that mount, when I was there, Holiday Inn wanted to build a temple. A temple. A hotel. A hotel. Holiday Inn wanted to build a hotel on the Mount of Olives. Prime location, beautiful view of, of the city of Jerusalem. But they couldn't because they found an earthquake fault from a prophecy written 600 years before Christ. Now, 2,000 years plus the 600 years, do a study and they find out there's an earthquake fault and it runs exactly east and west. And it's over top of, of a giant water reserve where the pressure is so great they thought if they drilled or they exploded to put the foundation down that the whole mountain would split in two. They don't know what's holding it together. And, and I looked it up and it's still the story is still on Google. And in fact, another hotel tried to look. Oh my goodness, it did it again. Why does it do that to me? Something happens with my batteries or something. Why did it do that? I want you to see the hotel. There we go. Good review. We have hope. Why? Because of the past, because of the promises, because of the prophecies. There we go. Oh. So there, there's a lot of things, but the earthquake line is there, and you can see that the temple, the temple is right there, and the earthquake fault runs right next to it. It's like east and west, and it's on there. And there's another hotel called the Seven Arches that tried to do this in the last 15 years. And they made them move the hotel a half a mile away because they said you can't you can't build here because you're right on the earthquake fault. So you can see the Valley of Kidron and right on the other side. It's, it's just all the geography, the details of scripture are so clear. So I have hope that God's plan is going to be fulfilled for the world, for Israel, for the church, and for me, because others have been right where I am. Because his promises are still true today. Because his prophecies about Israel, about the land, about the world, about the Lord's return in a little book called Zechariah are to the detail, the letter detail of stuff that they could have not possibly known until even a hundred years ago. To have the technology to determine an earthquake fault and to do all these things. Amazing, amazing stuff. Remember another earthquake in scripture? Any earthquakes around Jerusalem? Well, Sodom and Gomorrah to the south in the Old Testament Right, with gas exploding and, and, and all the fire and brimstone happening, that's just 20, 30 miles south of Jerusalem. So there's earthquake, there's another fall that runs. But even the day Jesus died, what happened? Right, the earth shook, the rocks were split, the tombs were opened. There was an earthquake. So the history of the earthquakes is certainly there. So I have hope. I have hope because of the past. God's record of his faithfulness gives me hope that I can get through today. I have hope because His promises are here for me today in the present. Not for things that I just want or wish for, but know what God has promised. And you won't be anxious, and you won't be angry, and you won't be depressed if you stick with what God has promised. I can have hope for the future because He already knows. His prophecies, just in this one little book, let me know God's got this in control. The right time, at the right place, Jesus came into Jerusalem on the fall. He died on the right day, in the right method. He was in the tomb the right number of days. He rose on the right number of days. And he's coming back at the right number of days. And nothing can stop his plan. So my hope for the future is based on that. Not that we don't face tough times. Not that things won't get more difficult. Not that I'm going to get everything that I want. And what also hasn't changed and what struck me this morning was his power. Just to add another P. That no matter what I'm facing, my God is bigger than this. Zechariah 4 says, not by might. Not by power, but by my spirit. That is what Zechariah is being told to tell Zerubbabel in building the temple again. Well, how are we going to do this? We've been at this two years, and we, we, we barely got a couple courses of lock laid. How are we ever going to do this? And the prophecy was, it's not going to be by your strength, your wisdom. It's going to be by God. And they were able to come together, start working, and four years later, we were able to dedicate that temple. Four years. After 70 years of of captivity and 16 years of living in defeat and buying the lies of the enemy, they were able to do it. Yeah, I wanted to close this morning with something a little bit different. I haven't done this in years, but 
My daughter and I were first married. We joined a young couples club, a young couples Bible study at our old church. And we were the young couple. You know, she was 19 and I was 24. And, and all these other couples were ancient, 30, 35, maybe even a few in their 40s. They were just, we were like, right? And we were the young couples of the young couples. And one night they played a video. We just got together, had some popcorn fellowship. And it was a video that was called, It's Friday, But Sunday's Coming. It, uh, how many have never heard of this? I mean, a couple of you are not. <laughs> Even if you heard it, it's worth it. It's worth it. You can Google it. Black preachers do it all the time. Tony Coppola made it famous on Focus on the Family. But Tony Coppola talks about going to a black church. When I get interviewed, I get asked, what's my favorite audience? Do you have a favorite audience? I say, oh, yeah. Give, give, give me black over white any day. Black audiences are better. Women are better than men. Women laugh a lot better than men. Black women, that's even better yet. And then <laughs> Pentecostal or Baptist. Black Pentecostal women is the holy of holies for comedians. I remember the first time I preached at a black church, Elder West. Uh, Sandy Bailey sang with us down there at like, like 7th Street in Chester. And I got up there, and this church was like, come on, brother, come on, preach, preach. And ladies, well, well, come on. And I got up there. I preached for an hour and ten minutes. My voice was shot. I was sweating. And little Elder West, he was like five foot two. He looked like the guy on the Jeffersons, you know, <laughs> moving on. I came up. Little Elder West came up and said, is that all you got? Is that all you got? <laughs> Give me that Bible, boy. And I sat down and he preached for another two hours. And then after him was another guy. It was a four-hour service. Then they had food. And then they had more church. <laughs> it was crazy. But it's Friday. Talks in that black style where the old black preacher gets up real quiet, real slow. It's Friday. It's Friday. Jesus is in the garden. His disciples have fallen asleep. It's Friday. It's dark. It's cold. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday, and the army shows up, and Jesus gets kissed on the cheek, and the next thing you know, he's at a trial. They, they beat him, and they spit on him, and he's falsely accused, but it's, it's Friday. It's Friday. Somebody said, come on, brother, preach. Sunday's coming. And then Pilate goes out before the multitudes and offers them Barabbas or Jesus, thinking certainly they would choose Jesus, but the crowd cries out, Barabbas. Jesus is flogged, and taken down the streets of Jerusalem, but it's Friday. It's Friday. Come on, somebody say, Sunday's coming. And he's so tired and weary under the load of the cross, he falls, he can't even get up. And, 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 and Rufus the Cyrene is called to carry his cross, and they get up to the mountain, and they drive the nails through his hands, and they stand that cross up, and he's gasping for breath, and he's in pain, and the crowd is mocking and taunting. Folks, it's Friday. It's Friday. The Sunday's coming. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And, and he, he ministers to the people, and then he breathes his last and says, It is finished. But he's dead on the cross. And the ground begins to shake. And the clouds get dark. And the whole place is going into turmoil. And, 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 and they don't know what they're going to do and they bring Jesus down and they stick him in a tomb and, and his heart's broken and his family's torn and his disciples are scattered and there's no hope in this world, folks, but it's Friday. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Now, Tony ends the sermon with, folks, for many of you, it's just Friday. Might be the beginning of a problem. It might be in the midst of a problem. Maybe the days are dark. Maybe everything you pointed and hoped is shaken. But you got to know this. It's only Friday. As we head into the next couple weeks. As you head into it, even outside the holy season. What's going on at work? What's going on in your neighborhood? What's going on in your family? What's going on in the world? What's going on with the North Korea? Whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's Friday. Jesus not already came to give us hope for our sins, but he's coming again. What's holding that mountain together in Jerusalem? The one who holds all things together. 
It's not going to be an atomic bomb. It's not going to be a nuclear war. It's going to be the toe of our Savior touching that nail. And it's going to split. Sunday's coming. Mm -hmm. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for hope. Hope no matter what we're facing. And I know this group here, this is the group you brought more. They need hope. For those who didn't come, maybe they'll listen. Maybe we can tell them more. There is hope for marriages. There is hope for our kids. There is hope for this world. There is hope for this church. Because your word is true. Because you are faithful. Because you can rescue a nation out of captivity. You can restore and gather the Jews from all over the world and bring them home. You are coming back for us. We thank you for hope. A certainty that cannot be taken. And the contentment that comes knowing that your plan will not fail. So we praise you and thank you for the hope that we have today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.